Hi, this is Steve Christie, also known as Born Again RN. In this video, I'm going to be responding to William Albrecht's video, uh, where he's refuting uh, Dr. Gavin Ortland's video that he made on the bodily assumption of Mary. Um, but first, I want to begin by stating that this is not a personal attack on William himself. I'm simply going to be critiquing his videos. I don't believe in personal attacks. Uh, they don't accomplish anything. And as the Apostle uh, Peter says, always be ready to give a defense of your faith for the hope that's in you, but to do so with gentleness of reference. So I'm not going to be attacking with any ad, ad hominems or anything like that, but strictly um, critiquing his video. Um, that he made against Dr. Ortland. Uh, also, this is not meant to be an exhaustive. Uh, William's video is about two hours long. I'm going to try to make this a lot shorter. I'm also not going to be doing any screenshots or anything in order to save time, but I'm going to be quoting both uh, William and some of the people that he's quoted as, as well as Dr. Ortland. Um, and, uh, but, and I'll also try to uh, include the original uh, videos of both of them in the description below the video so you can go to it as well as the timestamps from William's video in case you want to um, click on it and, and, and see specifically what I'm referring to. So uh, let's begin. Uh, in the first 10 minutes of the video or so, uh, roughly 10 minutes, there isn't really a, a whole lot there. It's William basically uh, talking to himself and the people that he's communicating with who are listening uh, stating that Dr. Ortland is wrong and that uh, he is misrepresenting the top um, Mariologist. But around the 9 minute 35 second or so, um, he does quote Dr. Ortland where he states that Eastern Orthodox and Catholics have similar views of the assumption of Mary, but William states that they are exact and that, quote, the view is no different at all. And yet, about a half a minute later at the 10-minute mark, William states that, quote, the only difference would be that Catholics are free to believe that Holy Mary either died or, or didn't die. Um, well, then it's not exact when you think about it, because in order for it to be exact, Eastern Orthodox and Catholics would have to agree about whether or not she died or not. Eastern Orthodox are very clear they, that uh, she died. That's part of the Dormition um, narrative. But with Roman Catholics, they have freedom, so it's not exact. Uh, uh, we advance to the 21-minute mark. William states that, quote, a very key marker in the early church was if you deny these teachings, meaning the, the uh, teachings of St. Mary, you were very likely to have been a part of a heretical group. So he's not just talking about the bodily assumption, but also some of the other Marian dogmas like the perpetual virginity. Because he goes on to say, quote, Arianism, for instance, is where the denial of St. Mary's perpetual virginity really exploded. Now we have to understand Arianism was based on a, a bishop by the name of Arius um, who lived in the early 4th century. So he's saying this is when it really exploded. But we actually have quotations from early church fathers even prior to this, uh, prior to the, to the early 4th century, who denied it. For example, uh, Irenaeus, who Pope Francis recently uh, made a doctor of the church in his work Against Heresies, uh, 3 Point to 21.10, he says, quote, as the protoplast himself, Adam, had his substance from untilled and as yet virgin soil, the Lord took dust from the earth and formed man. So did he who is the word, recapitulating Adam and himself, rightly receive a birth, enabling him to give up Adam into himself from Mary, who was as yet virgin. So what's the point? The point is that Irenaeus compares Mary as yet virgin to the as yet virgin soil because it was untilled. But once God formed man from the earth, it was no longer untilled. Likewise, once Jesus was born of the virgin, she was no longer untilled, just like the soil ceased to be virgin once God formed Adam from it. Uh, Hegesibus, who's also a contemporary of uh, Irenaeus, uh, uh, writing in the second century and quoted by Eusebius in his writing the church history uh, stated that Judas was quote Jesus's brother according to the flesh and this last part according to the flesh is significant because in Romans chapter 1 verse 3 the apostle Paul states that Jesus was a descendant of David according to the flesh meaning he was biological 
He was a biological descendant of him. And in Romans chapter 4, verse 1, uh, Paul states that Abraham was our forefather according to the flesh. To get across that Abraham was a biological forefather of the Jews. So likewise, when you when Hegesippus is stating that Judas was Jesus' brother according to the flesh, he's using that indicator uh, that designation in order to say that he was that Judas wasn't just a brother like a relative or a believing brother but rather he was a biological brother uh, Tertullian although he's not a early church father he was one of the most prolific writers and orthodox of the virgin birth and he's he's also writing late second or early third century Yet, he did not maintain the later ideas of Mary being ever-virgin, and even this term ever-virgin is used differently uh, early on, such as by Hippolytus and Athanasius, to simply refer to Mary as being ever-virgin uh, her whole life up to the point that she gave birth, while later on the term ever-virgin uh, got adopted to mean uh, perpetual. But anyways... Uh, Tertullian believed Christ had a normal birth, that his brothers were his siblings, not his cousins, and not older stepbrothers from an elite alleged previous mar marriage of Do Joseph. And also, if Mary were held to any kind of esteem during this time period, Tertullian would have certainly known about it. Even Raymond Brown, who is a Catholic author, uh, authored a book called Mary in the New Testament. He co-authored it with Joseph Fitzmaier, who was another Catholic author, where he writes, quote, There is no second century evidence of belief in Mary remaining a virgin after the birth of Jesus, apart from the implications of Proto-Evangelium. The later development of this doctrine went hand-in-hand -hand with the aesthetic glorification of virginity. You can find this on page 293. And the Proto-Evangelium he's talking about is a, a mid-to-late second century fall false gospel referred to as a proto-evangelium of James. It's also called the infancy gospel of James. And many people, including Origin of Alexandria in the early 3rd century, who believed in the perpetual virginity of Mary, based it on this work. Uh, let's see. So, uh, to, to advance them, at the 2617 mark, William states, quote, if you look at modern-day Protestant congregations, Protestants will cringe when you call Mary Mother of God. Uh, that's actually not true. It's not that they have a problem with the term Mother of God. They have a problem with the, the way later Catholics would apply it to Mary as a Mariological title as opposed to a Christological title, how it was originally used, such as in the Councils of Ephesus of 431 and Chalcedon in 541. So Mother of God or the Theotokos simply means who gave birth to one who was God. So the emphasis is on Jesus because they were fighting the heresy of Nestorianism who did not believe that Jesus was God, that Mary had given birth to God. He was trying to separate the Godship from, from his humanity. And all that was going on by referring to Mary as the mother of God is that, uh, that Jesus was, was fully man as well as fully God in the, in the flesh, but it was a title for... Um, to, for Jesus, it wasn't originally meant as a title for Mary, which later developed into her being Queen of Heaven and Mother of, of the Church. So, again, it's not that uh, Protestants have a problem with the term, but rather how uh, Catholics um, have used it uh, and, and how it is, had changed over time. At the 2748 minute, William states, quote, We, meaning Catholics and Protestants, have moved apart because there is no unity within Protestantism. But uh, when William addresses uh, the Protestant counter-argument, counter which, which he says, quote, well, there's no unity in Catholicism in these apostolic churches, William dismisses this, uh, saying, quote, it's not relevant, so let's not talk about the topic uh, today. Uh, but in reality, it is actually relative, be relative because not all early Orthodox Christians believed all the same things, even about Mary. Uh, Jimmy Aiken from Catholic Answers even acknowledged recently during an online debate or discussion that they were Protest there were Protestant beliefs in the early church. In fact, here's a clip from uh, YouTube channel uh, Yahoo Wan, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced the name, but it's Y-A-J-U-N, and the second part is Y-U-A-N if you want to look for his YouTube channel, and it's, um, the title is Jimmy Aiken on the Church Fathers and Protestant Beliefs will find things in the church fathers that 
are Protestant. Uh, I mentioned one earlier in uh, in our discussion, which is there are some early Christian writers that say, yeah, Mary had more than one kid, or yeah, Mary was a sinner. So okay, so he backed up what I said just a little while ago. Um, uh, Trent Horn from Catholic Answers, his contemporary, also said that 70% of American Catholics today reject the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. And the Magisterium has changed its leanings on capital punishment recently, uh, about whether or not baptized, unbaptized babies who die, where they go. Do they go to heaven? Do, do they go to limbo? Do they go someplace else? And even evolution, which conflicts with the early church, which Gideon Lazar, who is a Catholic who had debated uh, Jimmy Aiken, affirmed that it was basically unanimous in the early church of rejecting evolution and embracing a young creation. Uh, so, but in reality, the real reason for uh, moving apart is threefold. One, uh, the reformers were Catholic. Uh, so, and that's something that's really inter pertinent to this discussion is because their beef with Rome wasn't about Mary, but it was about the authority of Scripture or over the authority of the Church. So their radar wasn't even on Mary. It, it was it was about what a Christian's beliefs and doctrines and faith and morals are supposed to come from. Uh, second, as Protestants began to study Scripture beyond the authority issue, they realized that the Marian dogmas were not supported by Scripture. So they d dug deeper into scriptures in these specific areas, including Mary, that the, that the Reformers didn't because they were concerned about authority and justification by faith alone. And third, it wasn't until later in the 19th and 20th centuries that the dogmas of the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption of Mary were declared mandatory and binding for the Catholic to believe, attached with anathemas for rejecting them. So, and this is something that initially happened when the early church began to embrace uh, these dogmas. Um, it was something that was uh, something that they should believe, but it didn't have an anathema attached to it. It wasn't binding. It, it wasn't mandatory. You know, and this is one of the things that has contributed with the other two previous points I made, which is distanced um, Catholics from Protestants. So it's it's not strictly uh, the Protestants for the reason for their their distancing, but but Catholics as well. At the 28:30 minute mark, uh, William attempts to use the reformers who affirm the Marian dogmas, uh, but fails to mention that Calvin actually rejected the perpetual virginity of Mary. But these dogmas who um, these these reformers who affirm the Marian dogmas uh, had affirmed sola scriptura, and William gave uh, the the rejection of purgatory as an example. Quote. Why are you abandoning the faith of the Protestant reformers? Why are you abandoning what they believed in terms of Mariology? So in other words, he's saying since Protestants agree with the reformers for rejecting purgatory due to sola scriptura, then why don't you agree with them who affirm the Marian dogmas? Well, this is really a non sequitur because it doesn't follow that just because they were right about uh, purgatory not being biblical, that they were also right about the Marian dogmas. So, so it, it doesn't follow. And also it shows a, a lack of comprehension of what the reformers were about. The reformers were not about replacing the magisterium with them. They would have been horrified at that. Rather, their, their teachings was uh, to go by scripture as the authority, not them and not the, not the church, because they are human beings are fallible and capable of, capable of being wrong. In fact, when Luther was at the Diet of Worms in 1521, he said, unless you can um, convict me and convince me based on scripture and sound reason, I, I will not recant. Um, and so basically he was saying, unless you can show me from the scriptures themselves, um, I'm not going to change my mind because Scripture is my authority, not me, and, and not anybody else, which is something that they weren't able to do. So um, just a little note. Um, Protestants do revere Mary. A lot of times when Protestants are um, denying the Roman Catholic dogmas of the perpetual virginity of Mary, her bodily assumption, and her immaculate conception, right away it is assumed that they hate Mary. And, and it's not that. That's, that's also a not, non sequitur. They simply don't believe in the Catholic dogmas about Mary that are either biblically unsupported, such as my debate against Trent, or outright contradictum, or that they were 
they are supported by the infant church universally. So, and, and by infant church, I'm talking about the first few centuries. Sure, later on, as the fourth century and onward got on, you started seeing more and more acceptance for these dogmas, especially the early one, earlier one of the perpetual virginity of Mary. Um, but when you uh, look at the infant church, those first couple of centuries, um, you're hard-pressed to find early church fathers who did believe this, let alone the church universal as a whole. And, and that's really the, the significance here. At the 3150-minute uh, mark, uh, Dr. Orland quotes Mariologist uh, Eamon Duffy, calling him a historian. And I want to get that clear because he specifically calls him a historian as well as a scholar. Quote, the definition that is of the bodily assumption embarrassed many Catholic theologians since it was unsupported in scripture and unknown in the early church. And there is clearly no historical evidence whatsoever for it unless one counts the negative evidence of the lack of post-mortem relics of the virgin. End quote. A William disp- dismissed Duffy stating, quote, Duffy is not working on assumption or or assumption material. He never has in his entire life. He's never even written a book on it. Duffy is not a Dormition or bodily assumption scholar. He's not a Catholic historian, end quote. Well, if you listen to what Ortland said, he never said that Duffy was working on this or wrote it or, or anything else. He simply said that he was a historian. So this is a straw man. Uh, this is also a red herring on William's part because he is attacking the person referring to Duffy instead of his argument. And what Duffy said was correct, that there is no scriptural support or evidence in the infant church for the dogma that body that Mary was bodily assumed to heaven being verified from any orthodox source. And we'll talk a little, little bit more about that later, but I want to kind of go in order here. At the 38 minute, 10 second mark, uh, Dr. Ortland quotes Mariologist Stephen Schumacher's book, The Ancient Traditions of the Virgin Mary's Dormition and Assumption. Quote, there is no evidence of any tradition concerning Mary's Dormition and Assumption from before the 5th century. The only exception to this is Epiphanius' unsuccessful attempt to uncover a tradition of the end of Mary's life towards the end of the 4th century, and his failure confirms the otherwise deafening silence, and the 5th century has very little to offer until the very end when the first fragments of the Dormition appear, as well as limited indications from a few independent sources that confirm a sudden interest at this time in the end of Mary's life, end quote. Now, what William does is that he attempts to argue later that Epiphanius of Salamis, writing in the late 4th century, died in, in the early 5th, uh, affirmed the bodily assumption of Mary in his work Panarion 79. And we're going to talk about um, Panarion 79, Epiphanius, a little later. Uh, William also attempts to argue around the 40 minute 15 second mark that Schumacher is able to demonstrate that the assumption was believed in the second century where he quotes Schumacher here quote we may conclude with some degree of certainty that the earliest palm traditions were already in existence sometime before 400 CE and very probably earlier perhaps even as early as the second century I want to focus on those words uh, with some degree of certainty, very probably, and perhaps these are not these are not certain statements. Uh, and what Dr. Ortland is addressing is what Schumacher is able to prove historically. William, on the other hand, is addressing Schumacher's personal opinion based on his speculation, his best guess. But that's not the same thing. Another thing is just because something is ancient doesn't mean that it's apostolic. For example, the heresy of the Nicolaitans goes back to the first century, as does Gnosticism and Docetism, which extended into the second century, and of course Arianism and Nestorianism that were being fought in, in the fourth century and even beyond. Um, so just because something is ancient, that doesn't mean that it's apostolic. At the 44-minute mark, uh, Dr. Ortland quotes Mariologist Ludwig Ock, quote, The idea of the bodily assumption of Mary is first expressed in certain transitist narratives of the 5th and 6th centuries. Uh, the first church author to speak of the bodily assumption of Mary is in association with an apocryphal transitist BMV is St. Gregory of Tours. And just to give you an idea, uh, St. Gregory of Tours is a 6th century Catholic bishop. So, cons- you know, uh, So focus on that timing. Um, and what William does is he adds a section of Ott that was not quoted by, by Dr. Ortland. Quote, 
Even though these are apocryphal, they bear witness to the faith of the generation in which they were written, despite their legendary clothing. Again, what Dr. Ortland doing is addressing what Ott is able to prove historically where it is first expressed. William, on the other hand, is addressing Ott's personal opinion that it was accepted in that community. So remember, Ott and William have the burden of proof that it was already believed since uh, they are arguing in the affirmative. Uh, Dr. Ortland doesn't have to prove a negative. But even if it was believed, even if we were to concede this and, and, and grant that, Ott is dating this to the 5th and 6th century, which is not apostolic, but hundreds of years later and the time period that Dr. Ortland is, or, is arguing for. So, so far, we haven't had any evidence from any Mariologists or, or, or early church history that this was believed in the... T- uh, at the, in the second century. It's just speculated that it is. At the 46 minute 45 mark, William claims, quote, we have texts that clearly show in the 300 St. Ephraim was talking about Mary being bodily assumed into heaven. But what exactly does St. Ephraim the Syrian say? Does he say specifically body and soul into heaven? Uh, what does he base this on? Does he cite texts? Uh, are they orthodox? Are they heterodox? William doesn't really say. So in order to make this claim, this affirmative claim, William would have to demonstrate this, what he doesn't do in the video. Uh, another thing, too, is that this is late 4th century when Ephraim the Syrian is writing. Uh, and it's one person in a specific geographic location. So we should not assume that just because uh, one individual in a specific location uh, believes something, that it was believed by the church universal, let alone be an apostolic. And again, this is late 4th century. So even if he is saying this, this isn't far removed from the 5th century. Um, at the 4830 Second Mark, Dr. Ortland states, quote, I've heard people claim all the way back to the second century, but that has not been received into scholarship. And this wording received into scholarship is important because William attempts to discredit his claims since Schumacher expressed his opinion that it was believed, quote, very probably earlier, perhaps even as early as the second century, end quote. But this is not the same thing as being able to demonstrate evidence from the second century. And this is what it's meant by that has not been received into scholarship, meaning something that you can demonstrate. Any scholar can speculate and assume and come to educated um, guesses and conclusions that it's the second century. It's another thing to actually demonstrate this by quoting early church fathers or sermons or liturgies or, or anything else. Simply saying that something is it was in liturgy is not the same thing as actually being able to quote it. At the 49 minute 30 second mark, William asks Mariologist Daly uh, in, in a video discussion, quote, friends within Catholicism, Syriac Orthodoxy, Eastern Orthodoxy, pretty much every branch that we can call a branch of ancient Christianity, I've noticed that it seems like we all hold to these ancient traditions on the Dormition and the Assumption. Would it be fair to say that the ancient branches of the church share in this common believing in this Dormition and Assumption of Mary, end quote? While Daly affirmed that many of them do, again, just because Christian traditions today do and throughout history held to some of these beliefs, it doesn't necessarily follow that these beliefs reflect the beliefs of these same traditions in the infant church in those first few centuries. And Daly's comments didn't reflect that that they did back then, nor did he provide any evidence that they did. Again, speculation versus what can actually be proven which is something William would need to do in his video, which at this point he hasn't done yet. At the 55-minute mark, we're about halfway uh, through the discussion. Uh, William addressed Epiphanius' Panarian 79 and Mariologist Father Christian Capus, who William co-authored a book on Mary with. William states that there is no better uh, Mariologist than, than Father Capus. But once again, you see how they exegete Panarian 79, you'll see that Epiphanius is not saying what William and Father Capus are claiming that he is saying. So regardless of who the individual was or his credentials, you have to go back to the text. You have to allow the text, whether it's the writings of early church fathers or scriptures, you have to let the text speak for itself and compare what they're saying to the text. Just like the noble Bereans, that they compared what the Apostle Paul was saying to scripture. That's why they were more noble-minded.
For example, Epiphanius compares Mary's body to other saints that should not be worshipped, and, and he gives Elijah, the Apostle John, and, and Thecla as examples not to worship. He then goes on to compare Mary's body to Elijah's, who retained his virginity and was taken up to heaven. At the 58 minute 30 second mark, William addresses a question that I had asked him a while ago on his channel, Patristic Pillars, um, that if this is the context, then Epiphanius is also comparing Mary to the Apostle John's body who leaned on the Lord's breast. So where in scripture or early church history does it record Mary doing this, leaning her head on the Lord's breast. It's not in scripture, and as far as I know, it's nowhere in church history prior to uh, Epiphanius if he indeed um, meant it this way. Uh, at the 58-55 second mark, William attempts to respond to this argument, quote, you can't take the whole sum of all of these parallels. You also cannot take it to be a parallel of her being taken up and not seeing death in Elijah, end quote. But this is kind of a non-answer because if Mary's parallel to Elijah was that she was that she also remained a virgin and was also taken up without seeing death, just as Elijah did, because remember, that's the comparison, then Mary's parallel to John was that she also laid her head on the Lord's breast like John did. This it, this is relevant. And this is the this is the parallel. So William's denial of this later parallel is eisegetical because he cannot say Mary was like Elijah because he remained a virgin and was bodily assumed, but then go on to say that Mary was not like John who leaned on the Lord's breast. So you cannot affirm the one parallel of Epiphanius without affirming the other, which William is doing and doing so inconsistently. Rather, the context of Panarion 79 is that Epiphanius is warning not to worship Mary like some cultist groups were doing because her body is not deity, but human, no different than these other three saints. The reason why Epiphanius mentions Elijah being caught up to heaven and John leaning on the Lord's breast is to create designations and distinctions between these men and others in scripture and history who have the same name. For example, there are at least four Elijahs in the Old Testament and at least four Johns in the New Testament. In fact, you see this done in Scripture and the early church. For example, uh, Scripture refers to James the son of Alphaeus and dis uh, makes a distinction between him and James the brother of John in order not to confuse the two Jameses with the same name. Likewise, in the early church, there are two Johns who had died in Ephesus, John the Elder and John the Apostle, who leaned his head on the Lord's breast. And again, they were, they're both from Ephesus. So Panarian, so Panarian 79, Epiphanius, he's no, being no different than referring to Elijah being caught up to heaven and John leaning on the Lord's breast, because um, to, dis, to distinguish them from other people in Scripture and early church who have the same name. At the one hour, three minute mark, William quotes Epiphanius from Panaria 78, quote, The Holy Virgin may have died and been buried. Her falling asleep was with honor, her death and purity, her crown and virginity. Or she may have been put to death, as the scripture says, and a sword shall pierce through her soul. Her fame is among the martyrs, and her body by which light rose in the world rests amid blessings or she remained alive for god is not incapable of doing whatever he wills no one knows her end end quote a couple things first epiphanius is stating that mary died and definite and was definitely supported by scripture a, a, a sword shall pierce through her soul so she he's saying that scripture supports her dying which is interesting um, because that kind of conflicts with the dogma of the immaculate of the bodily assumption in 1950 because it gives the catholic the option of whether or not she died first so epiphanius is actually conflicting with this dogma which leaves it open even though the dogma strongly implies that um th that she died first but it's not definitive second uh, when Epiphanius says she could have remained alive and that no one knows her end, he is not insinuating that he believes Mary could have been bodily assumed. He is simply acknowledging that God could do whatever he wanted. He's addressing his omnipotence without assuming that she was bodily assumed to heaven. Rather, her being bodily assumed to heaven must be 
read exegetically back into Epiphanius and Panarius 78. At the 1 hour 10 minute 50 second mark, uh, when William interviews Daly, another, uh, again, another Mariologist about Epiphanius, Daly states, quote, If she, meaning Mary, died in the grace of Christ her son, she must be with him in some, some sense in heaven, end quote. But in this statement, Daly is not insinuating that Epiphanius is saying Mary was bodily assumed into heaven, but this too must be read eisegetically into what Daly actually said, and even more so into Epiphanius, who isn't even insinuating an assumption. When the elect die and go to heaven, their spirit goes, not their bodies. And that's all that happened to Mary. When she died, her spirit went to, went to heaven. So she died in the grace of Christ her son, and she is in some sense in heaven with him. And the, at the um, 1 hour 14 minute 5 second, Mark, uh, when Dr. Ortland brings up Tertullian's work, Resurrection of the Dead, William argues, quote, Tertullian is not trying to recount everyone that is bodily translated, end quote. But William's argument, again, it's straw man, because that's not Dr. Ortland's point about bringing up Tertullian or Tertullian's purpose. His point is that in 63 chapters, where he provided a comprehensive overview of those who were bodily assumed or ascended to heaven, such as Enoch, Elijah, Jesus, and possibly Paul and John, that it would be highly unlikely that Tertullian would have not mentioned Mary being assumed as well. Because if in the early church, if their devotion to Mary was as strong as a contemporary Catholic church is today, uh, which dogmatized her assumption, attaching it with anathema for denying it, Tertullian certainly would have mentioned Mary since he mentioned these other saints who were not who would not have been as revered as much as Mary allegedly was. So think about it. Mary in Roman Catholicism is the second most important person after Jesus in human history. And yet Tertullian, who is very familiar with Mary and Orthodox you know, in, uh, in Mariology, doesn't even mention her among all these other saints in 63 chapters, which talk about other people being assumed or ascended to heaven. Um, so on his work, Resurrection of Dead, that I mentioned earlier, Tertullian describes every instance in 63 chapters, providing a comprehensive overview of every person who came close to a near-death experience and was revived or was taken up to heaven, mentioning a large number numbers of individuals, Enoch, Elijah, Daniel, uh, Jonah, Jesus, and yeah, Lazarus. Yet he does not mention Mary being bodily assumed to heaven. Under these circumstances, Tertullian met both criteria for a legitimate argument from silence of Mary's perpetual virginity and bodily assumption not being historic events, which appear in later, earlier and later Gnostic and Gnostic-like works, uh, such as Pseudomiletus, Odes of Solomon, Ascension of Isaiah, Proto-Evangelium of James, Gospel of Peter, etc., and it's not just Tertullian. Clement of Rome, writing in the late 1st century, or possibly mid-1st century, depending on, on your time, uh, and Methodius cite Enoch and Elijah, who didn't die and were translated to heaven, but never mentioned Mary. Irenaeus, who was recently, again, made a doctor of the church by uh, Pope Francis in his work Against Heresies 5.5, cites Enoch, Elijah, and Paul, not Mary, uh, and Hippolytus, uh, Methodius, and other early church fathers do comment on Revelation chapter 12, but nothing about an assumption. Now, we're going to talk at the very end about the earliest Greek commentary on Revelation chapter 12, which is not as early as you think, but but we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Um, at the 1 hour 21 minute 15 second mark, after Dr. Ortland brings up conflicting views in the 5th and 6th century of Mary's Dormition, including Mary's death, he points out that even the city where she died was not universally agreed on. Some believe it was Jerusalem, some believe it was Ephesus. Attempting to address this, William uh, mentioned Catholic Steve Ray stated that the answer to this is that the ones who were historians back then came to the conclusion. What's the conclusion? that Mary was bodily assumed to heaven. But Ray's answer doesn't address the question, why is the city Mary died on not agreed by them, even in the early church, even by these historians? Because, if, again, if Mary was revered as much as Catholics claim the infant church was about her, wouldn't they have at least agreed universally on the city she died on? Now, some Catholics will say, well, uh, Catholics are... Um, in dispute about what tomb that Jesus was buried on. There's, there's two tombs, uh, the traditional tomb and, and, and a more um, modern term that is believed to be more historic. But there's no 
disagreement about the actual city that he was crucified in, which was in Jerusalem, and he was by, he, and he was buried in Jerusalem. But Catholics don't know where Mary was bodied, where the actual city was. So, so that's the distinction. At 1 hour 24 minutes, uh, William quotes St. Jacob, who, quote, definitely believed in the bodily assumption of Mary. But what William fails to reveal is that St. Jacob is writing in the late 5th century, which is when this belief begins to become accepted. So it's a non-issue, bringing him up. But to, to progress, at the 1 hour 24 minute 55 minute second mark, uh, William states that St. Jacob is, quote, poeticizing this incredible bodily assumption, end quote. And then quotes St. Jacob stating, quote, she wove a beautiful crown and set it on her sublime head on which valuable pearls were laid. Now remember, William just said that St. Jacob is poeticizing the bodily assumption in Revelation chapter 12, so keep that in mind. But So this does not necessarily imply a bodily assumption, no more than in Luke 16, verse 24, when the rich man in Hades asked Abraham to send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool it off on his tongue. So whether or not this is a parable is irrelevant, since Jesus is talking about the afterlife where disembodied spirits go. So William is correct that Jacob is poeticizing Revelation chapter 12, which includes a crown being placed on her head, but not that he is saying her transmission to heaven was bodily. Again, he's poeticizing. This also occurs in Revelation chapter 4, where saints in heaven remove crowns off their heads and place them before the throne of God. Again, a bodily assumption must be assumed and read into the writing of St. Jacob. At the 1 hour 31 minute 45 second mark, Dr. Ortland quotes daily, quote, The story of Mary's remarkable death and her most immediate entry into the transformed condition of Christ's body seems first to have been circulated among anti-Chalcedonian Christians in the late 5th century, end quote. William here argues that the anti-Chalcedonian Christians were the Oriental Orthodox, which means they were Orthodox, not heterodox. But even if Dr. Ortland was not aware of their heterodox identity, let's give him the benefit of the doubt, Daly still concedes that this was late 5th century, which is consistent with Dr. Ortland's actual argument as the time period when the Sumerian dogma becomes more accepted. It also doesn't change the fact that the dogma is found in early heterodox texts. Uh, so to advance, 1 hour 34 minute 10 second mark, Williams cites Schumacher again, who addresses some claims that this dogma originated in Gnostic texts, which Dr. Orkman mentioned in his original video, which Schumacher goes on to claim that it wasn't. However, once again, this is just Schumacher claiming this, and he doesn't provide any evidence that it originated in Orthodox text. Remember, the burden of proof is on Schumacher, let alone scripture prior to the, to the late 5th century where we first find Christians accepting it. At the 1 hour 38 minute uh, 30 second mark, uh, for some reason William felt the need to bring up the differences between Catholic and Protestant biblical canons, which uh, the latter he called, quote, mutilated. So I don't know what the point was bringing up the canon. I know William does like to do this even in debates like against um, uh, Dr. Michael Brown, when they were talk, debating about purgatory, he wanted to change the debate into the canon. If um, you want to see this, uh, you can go on uh, uh, Marlin's uh, channel where they originally had their debate, where he tries to change the debate um, uh, mid-debate. But anyways, um, what was I going to say? And William had encouraged people to visit Gary Machuda's YouTube channel, Apocrypha Com Apocalypse. Well, I have visited it, and what I would do is that I don't just leave comments. I listen to the videos before I comment on it because I didn't want, don't want to be accused of a troll. A troll is somebody who leaves comments but doesn't bother to watch the video because they're just trying to push an agenda. Rather, I take the time to listen to the videos, and then I present a, a comment. That That's called being objective. Um, because you're pointing out things in the video that are not necessarily being discussed. And I would encourage both Catholics and Protestants to do this, uh, re regardless of what YouTube channel you, you go on, because it shows objectivity, and then you can't be accused of being a troll. Anyways, uh, I had I visited, I listened to literally dozens of their videos in their entirety, and they were only able to demonstrate three things. One, 
that Gentile Christians in the early church did not espouse to identical canons, let alone the identical canon defined at the Council of Trent in 1546, including the 4th century church councils. Now, Gary and William would argue they are identical, but I've argued in the past in my debates that they are not because they didn't have identical books. And you can check that out on my debates on my YouTube channel where I debated both Gary Machuda and Trent Horn. Number two, um, numerous church fathers included lists that included books not found in Catholic Old Testament, such as Athanasius, who included the Didache and the Shepherd of Her Hermas in his second tier, along with the Deuterocanon, which, by the way, excluded the books of the Maccabees. This was in Athanasius' third tier, which he called Apocrypha. And three, Gary concedes that there are both early Jewish and Christian lists that are identical to Protestant Old Testaments, but you can't say that about the Catholic Old Testament prior to the 5th century. Also, check out my YouTube channel, Born Again RN, under my playlist, Why Protestant Bibles Are Smaller, and check out some of my recent interviews on the canon, such as with Dr. Michael Brown, Dr. Tony Costa, Turretin Fan, and, and others, if you're interested. So anyways, in order to get back to the, to the, uh, the topic, uh, William states that Protestantism looks nothing like apostolic Christianity. But the same can be said about contemporary Catholicism. Again, even Jimmy Aiken from Catholic Answers has stated that not only did the early church n not all agree on everything, but that there were Protestant beliefs in the early church, including denying the perpetual virginity of Mary and the other Marian dogmas, including the Assumption. So this is why we must allow the early church fathers to be the early church fathers, letting them speak for themselves and not try to anachronistically impute either Catholicism or Protestantism into the early church as if it was solely as as if the church solely embraced only one kind of ecclesiology. And this is one thing that I see with Protestant apologists, at least the ones that take the early church seriously. So at the 1 hour 40 minute 50 second mark Dr. Ortland quotes Schumacher, quote, Although this exegesis that is interpreting the woman, that is the woman of Revelation chapter 12, as Mary, would subsequently become quite popular and has endured even to this day, there is no evidence of its existence before Epiphanius. On the contrary, the early church unanimously identified the apocalyptic woman with the church. William states that there are a lot of metaphorical images in Revelation, but a careful reading of Scripture can identify what these images symbolize. Dr. Ortland brings up the obvious point that even if the woman in Revelation chapter 12 is Mary, the text does not even hint of a bodily assumption. It doesn't. It simply says this woman is in heaven, not that she had taken up to heaven bodily. This too must be read exegetically or eisegetically into the text. And again, look what Schumacher actually says that there's unanimously they identified it as a church and there's no evidence of this before Epiphanius. And Epiphanius is writing uh, in the late 4th century. And even Epiphanius, as we demonstrated earlier, is, did not teach a bodily assumption of Mary. Again, that too is eisegetical. At the 1 hour 42 minute mark, William attempts to defend this is Mary by eisegeting Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 where God tells the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, believing that the woman is Mary, and between your seed and her seed, meaning her seed meaning Mary's seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. I was actually kind of surprised that William said, He shall bruise your heel, and you will bruise his heel, meaning Jesus as he and his. Because this is not based on Jerome's Latin translation, where he used the feminine ipsa to refer to Mary which the Pope used to establish the Immaculate Conception in the 19th century. Rather, the Latin for he, which is the correct translation, is from the later Clementine Vulcate, which used the masculine ipsun, which corrected Jerome's mistranslation. This is also supported by Romans chapter 16, verse 20, which states that the prince, referring to Jesus, will crush the serpent. So the ones whose heel is bruised isn't Mary, nor does Mary bruise the head. Um, also, if you read all of Genesis chapter 3, the woman is clearly Eve, not Mary. The word woman is used nine times in this chapter because Adam had not named his wife Eve yet. He didn't do this until after this verse, in, uh, until verse 20. So the woman is clearly Eve, not Mary. 
it would be Eve's future seed, Jesus, who would crush the seed of the serpent. This is why after Eve gives birth to Cain in Genesis 4.1, she assumes incorrectly uh, Cain was this promised seed when she said, quote, I have gotten a man-child, the Lord. It also re supports her future seed would be God, since the Hebrew uses the tetragrammaton for Lord translated Jehovah. Uh, so, and, and when we read the Hebrew, it's a, again, it says, I have gotten a man-child, the Lord. She thought that she had given birth. So this is how we know that the woman is talking about Eve, not Mary, since Eve believed that she had given birth, that this was her, her seed. Also, the word woman in the New Testament is not strictly designated for Mary. Uh, for example, uh, Jesus calls Mary Magdalene woman. Uh, the woman who, uh, with an infirmity in Luke chapter 13 is addressed as woman. The the woman caught in, adul in adultery, Jesus calls woman. The whore riding the scarlet beast in Revelation 17 is called woman. And there's several other examples. So Genesis 3.15 does not support the woman in Revelation 12 is Mary, let alone bodily assumed to heaven. Because uh, there's, a, there's a lot of stretches, a lot of dots you have to connect, and it just doesn't work. Rather, the woman is the nation of Israel, which Dr. Ortland correctly identifies, and not the nation of Israel and, and Mary, which we're going to explain why in a moment. Because he compares her being clothed in the sun, moon, and twelve stars, which we find Israel being described this way in Genesis 37, verses 9 through 10. Plus, Isaiah 26 describes the nation of Israel being a pregnant woman experiencing labor pains, ready to give birth, just as the woman is described in Revelation 12. And or in Revelation 12, so I want to read from Isaiah chapter 26, verses 15, 17, and 18. You have increased the nation, O of Lord, referring to the nation of Israel. As the pregnant woman approaches the time to give birth, she writhes and cries out in her labor pains. We were pregnant. We writhed in labor. We gave birth. So it is, John is clearly drawing from Isaiah. Another thing is that Jesus was from the tribe of Judah, which is one of the 12 tribes of Israel, which means Israel had birthed the male child Jesus. John was using imagery borrowed from Genesis chapter 37 and Isaiah 26 to identify the woman as being Israel, not Mary. Sure, Mary literally and physically gave birth to Jesus, but again, as William said, uh, he's using it, he's using it um, He's poeticizing uh, Revelation chapter 12. It's, it's not meant to be hyper-literal. At, at the 1 hour 45 minute 10 second mark, when William cites Isaiah 7, where a sign is given that a, womb, that a virgin will conceive and bear a son. But this prophecy is fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1. It is not the sign in Revelation 12 because that sign takes place in heaven while the Isaiah sign takes place on earth. So William, again, is eisegetically assuming and conflating these two completely different signs simply because the, the same word is used. But that is another non sequitur and an assumption about the assumption. Uh, at the 1 hour, 45 minute, 45 second mark, William affirms uh, Psalms chapter 12 is a messianic psalm, but then asks, quote, Who is the woman that gave birth to the one that will rule over the nations? It is Mary, end quote. But when we read Psalm chapter 2, it doesn't say anything about a woman who gives birth. In verse 7, where it says, You are my son, today I have begotten you. This is referring to God the Father begetting Jesus, not Mary. At the 1 hour 47 mark, William argues that the birth pains experienced by the woman in Revelation 12 are not literal, but, quote, metaphorical. But that is mere speculation and subjectivity on William's part. Because William knows if he acknowledges that birth pains are literal, then that would negate Mary's immaculate conception, since birth pains were the penalty placed on Eve and by extension to all pregnant women as a result of the fall which resulted in sin. Plus, if the woman in Genesis 3 is Mary and not Eve, it also states there that the woman experienced birth pains for the same reason. So, William must either deny that bodily assumption or the immaculate conception. Based on his exegesis of scripture, um, he can't believe in both. 
one or the other must be denied. Dr. Orland also states that it would be highly unlikely that anyone who has never heard of the assumption would connect the woman of revelation to Mary being bodily assumed. And I want to focus on the words never heard. He, he specifies this. He's not talking about anybody. He's talking about people who specifically never heard of the assumption. At the 1 hour 47 minute 25 second mark, William attempts to present the, quote, oldest Greek extent complete commentary on the book of St. John's Revelation, end quote, which is by Ecumenius, and I apologize if I butchered the pronunciation. But what William fails to mention is that this oldest Greek commentary is dated to the late 6th, early 7th century. By then, Ecumenius would have known about the assumption from the earliest transitist writings for at least a century. Remember, Dr. Ortland stated those who had never heard of the assumption would not have made this connection. Obviously, this would not have applied to Ecumenius because he's writing later. William also brought up Andrew of Caesarea, but he too is also writing late 6th, early 7th century. So he too would have been familiar with this assumption. So William's refutation of Dr. Ortland simply doesn't work. So in summary, William failed to demonstrate that Dr. Ortland misrepresented the top Mariologist, but rather it was actually William who did because he did not demonstrate the difference between what they were able to prove from the writings in the early church which versus what these Mariologists, these top Mariologists, simply assumed about the assumption and the mission of Mary. William also demonstrated eisegesis of not only scriptural texts like Genesis 3 and, and Revelation 12, attempting to say they are about Mary, when exegetically they are about Eve and Israel respectively. But he also demonstrated inconsistent eisegesis of Epiphanius when he attempted to parallel Mary to Elijah being assumed to heaven, but dismissed Mary lying on the Lord's breast like the Apostle John did. Lastly, William at the very end asked for us to pray for his family and Dr. Ortland's family. So regardless of which side we fall on this, whether we side on the Catholic side or the Protestant side, William's side or uh, Dr. Ortland's side, I agree we should pray for them. It is important that we pray for those who disagree with us theologically, including William, and not just for those who we agree with. I have no animosity at all towards William Albrecht. I just disagree with his theology, which is why I don't attack with personal insults or ad hominems. I attack the argument, not the person. So I pray for both William and his family, as well as Dr. Ortland's as his. Thank you for listening. God bless, and stay safe out there.